Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our Community United Conversation webinar. Uh, this evening, we are going to be talking about oral health needs and dental services here in Oxford County. So we're really excited to share some information um, and to really have a great discussion with our panelists. My name is Kelly Gilson. I am the Executive Director with United Way Oxford. And I thank all of you for joining us uh, at home or at work this evening and certainly over the coming days, weeks and months for those that will be watching um, a recorded version. So um, please know how much we appreciate your support. I just am going to start, if I may, with a land acknowledgement. We think it's very important to recognize the land in which we are on. And so we will begin this meeting by acknowledging that we are on Indigenous land that has been inhabited by Indigenous peoples from the beginning. As settlers, we are grateful for the opportunity to meet here, and we thank all of the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. So long before today, as we gather here, there have been Indigenous peoples who have been stewards of this place. In particular, we acknowledge the traditional territory of the Ananashpik, Lanape, and the Haudenosaunee. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties. We recognize and deeply appreciate their historic and current connection to this place. We also recognize the contributions of the Métis, Inuit, and other Indigenous peoples that ha who have made and are making both in shaping and strengthening our community in particular and our province and our country as a whole. As settlers, this recognition of the current contributions and historic importance of Indigenous peoples must also be clearly and overtly connected to our collective commitment to make the promise and the challenge of truth and reconciliation real in our communities and in particular to bring justice for murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls across our country and in memory of the deceased children and the survivors of the Indian residential schools. So if you're not joining us here in Oxford County, please take a moment and reflect on um, the land which you are joining us from. Thank you. So as we get started, um, we are, I'm just going to give you a little brief overview of United Way, like a little United Way 101, and then we'll get into um, our, our event for the evening. So first and foremost, United Way Oxford is 100% local. Everything we do is for Oxford, by Oxford, in Oxford. The monies we raise stay here in Oxford County to help Oxford County residents the decisions on how we invest in those programs and services to help change lives are made by Oxford County volunteers who are really knowledgeable and grounded in the needs and the gaps in services across our community. We invest in three pillars, if you will. We, uh, one is moving people from poverty to possibility. We really want to give people that hope for a better future. We also want to build strong communities with healthy people. And in our case, often that involves programs related to mental health and addiction services, but you'll hear tonight about some others as well in that particular pillar. And then our final pillar is building, um, ensuring that kids can be all that they can be. And for us, that's supporting children and youth and their families to make sure that they have the access to supports, resources, and activities to thrive and to grow and, and to really become healthy, well-rounded adults as they transition into adulthood. And I know people think of United Way as a fundraiser, and um, certainly we do that. Uh, there is no pretending otherwise. In fact, right now we're in the middle of our annual campaign uh, looking for dollars. But I think what is often overlooked is the only reason we do that is so that we have the dollars available to invest in the programs and services that are needed in the community. That is where our heart is. That is really our work that matters. That's our impact. And so, you know, above and beyond investing with these wonderful partners um, and these, uh, you know, really vital programs and services, we also believe that we have a role to build capacity 
to ensure that there's training and supports, to promote volunteerism, um, to really uh, uh, allow community members opportunities to make a difference in their own community. Um, and so this is a great example of this webinar series is we talk about we want to shine a light on unignorable issues. And, and we it's a host of issues. We've been doing this for a number of years now. We want people to, to learn, to become more aware, um, and to build empathy and understanding. But we also want to be able to show and, and highlight the wonderful supports that are out there and those services. And so it's really important that we are in a position to be able to utilize technology like this, um, in particular over the last few years, to help spread that word and to grow capacity across our community. So for those joining again, thank you for taking the time and being interested to learn more about some of these unignorable social issues, social conditions, and, and what our supports and services are, because we are blessed with many. And uh, my last little bit before we get going is to just say, this is um, a technological world um, and we are not necessarily the most advanced technological folks, at least I am not. And so if there's you know, a few little glitches, please bear with us, we're, we're doing the best. Um, I you know, often say, I'm not gonna quit my day job for doing this. So we're trying, but we're, we're here to have a conversation and to really, I, I think, just help spread some really great information because whether it's um, oral health and dental care, like we're talking about tonight, or many of the other uh, topics that we have previously discussed or will discuss, um, things are never quite what they seem. Uh, a lot of these issues are much more complicated, much more complex. Um, really, they are, they are like an onion, and we're just going to peel back a few little layers. So that's that's my, my intro and my spiel. Thank you for joining us again this evening. And I am going to um, now introduce our panelists because this conversation is nothing without our wonderful panelists who bring a wealth of experience and knowledge and, and context to, to, to what we all need to know a little more about. So I'm going to start in no particular order, um, but we'll start with the um, Zachary Hollingham, who is the Director uh, Clinic and Client Services for the Oxford County Community Health Centre. Hi, Zach. Uh, once I go around, I'm going to then ask you to introduce yourselves because you can do a much better job than I, um, but I'll, I'll at least get you started. How's that? Um, and then we have uh, two wonderful folks joining us from the Schulich School of Medicine and Dentistry from Western University. Um, we have Dr. Abbas Jasani, who is the Assistant Professor, Division of Restorative Dentistry, Director Oral Health Outreach and Community Service, uh, Cross Appointment Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics. And if that fits on one business card, I would eat my shirt. <laughs> He's kind of a big deal. He's kind of a big deal. I know. So thank you so much for joining us, Abbas. And we have Roxana Militaru, which I might not have quite gotten right, but Roxana, uh, Roxy is a student, a dental student, and actually has recently finished a placement at the Oxford County Community Health Center. So has some wonderful stories to share. And last but certainly not least, we hit, have Kim Kazir from Ox Southwest uh, Public Health, who is a program manager there overseeing the uh, community dental programs, the low income senior dental care program in particular, which is one that we want to know a lot more about this evening. So thank you all for joining us. And um, I'm just going to go around by the boxes on my screen. Zach, would you like to just do a better job of introducing yourself and a little bit about your role and, and the Oxford County Community Health Center as well? Absolutely, Kelly. Yeah, thank you. First of all, thanks for inviting me to this conversation. It's a pleasure to be here um, to have a conversation about what you called an unignorable topic, ironically, about a body part or part of the body that's long been ignored by our publicly funded healthcare system. Um, so I'm glad we're having this conversation. Uh, my name is Zach Hollingham, and I'm the Director of Clinic 
and Client Services at the Oxford County Community Health Center. Uh, so I direct and manage many of our uh, programs and services, which includes our community dental clinic, which will be a uh, subject of further conversation today. And uh, just a, it is kind of hard to boil down exactly what we do into, into kind of a concise statement, uh, but I guess put most simply, our mandate is to reduce health inequities in Oxford County by providing a, a really wide range of healthcare and support services for those who need it most. Um, those who experience low income or are marginalized for other reasons, for example, with uh, those living with mental health conditions, a variety of other chronic conditions, um, isolated seniors, uh, per persons who are refugees, uh, as well as those with um, those are who are underhoused or homeless. And we do this, I guess, first and foremost as a team of healthcare providers, uh, social service providers, and administrators. And we work to be that kind of one stop shop um, for people to access care that influences all the different facets of their health. Um, so that includes. Uh, for example, you know, obviously our physician and nurse practitioner services, so 2,000 uh, residents of Oxford call us their family doctor's office or nurse practitioner's office, but uh, wrapped around that and wrapped around the client are counseling services, uh, sexual assault specific services, physiotherapy services, um, dietitian services, uh, our mobile health outreach bus, which goes out on the road to meet folks where they're at in the community, uh, our community outreach team, as well as our housing stability team, which supports people in both uh, attaining housing as well as uh, preventing uh, homelessness or under housing. So we just have a wonderful team of staff that provides a variety of services, many of which are accessible to the community, including our dental clinic. You do have a wonderful team of staff. It, it's uh, for us, it's always a pleasure when we get to partner with the Oxford County Community Health Center, which we've done like a thousand times over in a thousand different ways. Um, but it really speaks to that wraparound support of helping people um, to really ensure that they can access the supports and services they need, because sometimes, often, actually, it is really hard for folks to be able to do that. So, um, Abbas, if I may move to you, would you like to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Thank you very much, Kelly. And before I introduce myself, I really want to echo your last comment about uh, the work that the Oxford County Community Health Center is doing. Like, I honestly have no words. Every time I've interacted with the team, with the stakeholders at the community center, the passion, the dedication, the professionalism, the expertise that we have seen on every and any level uh, in my interaction with them, and um, and uh, our students will also agree with that, it's just amazing. And this is, this is the kind of work we want more and more in our communities and expose our students and, and be a part of, of, of uh, of, of such organization. So, um, so I'm Abbas Sasani and I am an assistant professor uh, at the Shulik School of uh, Dentistry. I um, wear two main hats in the department. Firstly, I am a restorative dentist, meaning I am trained um, or I focus on filling and drilling and filling teeth. When you have to decay in the teeth, then I know the magic tricks of what to take off the tooth and what to keep in and, and, and then fill it in with the materials that can help you chew and smile and um, function again. And the second hat that I wear currently is um, that I'm a director of the Oral Outreach uh, uh, Community Service Learning uh, program at Chulik, which is a very, which is in a very um, initial um, developmental and also I would say a very evolutionary phase as well. Um, so our goal here um, at Chulik is to uh, expand the community service learning opportunities for our students um, where we want to serve and we want to be of service to our, our, our local community members, specifically the community members who cannot advocate for themselves and who have barriers to healthcare services because of not fault of their own. Um, because um, they, um, they come from the socioeconomical um, um, strata um, that basically inhibits them to access dental services or because of their, um, their chronic conditions or because of their indigenous status or because of their minority genders and so forth. 
Um, so our, our, our main responsibility is to, to, to reach out to them and to build that trust and, um, and, and to serve them in any and every possible way to help them um, with, their, with their oral care problems. And we are doing it in different capacities um, by reaching out to our local uh, organizations, community organizations in London, such as the Oxford County Community Health Center. Um, currently, we are also, like mainly we are focused on Southwestern Ontario, but we're expanding um, outside Southwestern Ontario. This year, we also piloted our first international service learning in Africa. We took our students to Uganda and Rwanda to expand our services there. So um, and yeah, but this is also a very, very teeny tiny drop in the bucket. I think we have lots, lots to do and lots to accomplish, but I can say we are off to a, a good start. That's wonderful. Uh, Roxy, would you like to introduce yourself? Oh, you're on mute. Because one watching. Zoom meeting would be complete yes. without that statement. I was, yeah. <laughs> I was waiting for the technical issue to start. <laughs> And here we go. Um, but thank you so much for the lovely introduction. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Roxy and I am a fourth year dental student at the Schulich uh, Dental School here in London, Ontario. Um, I have had the pleasure of working with both Dr. Dasani and Zach on this community outreach uh, initiative and program. And I'm very thankful for the opportunity to be part of it, see it and help it grow. Um, as they both mentioned, I think it's a very important like um, project that they're building and there's so much more that can be done because it's just the start and so I'm excited to see where that goes and I've had the opportunity to work uh, at the clinic for four weeks and just kind of see everything they do and how much it impacts uh, the individuals of the community. We are really looking forward to hearing more about your experience because I think also above and beyond the conversation um, stories really matter. Right. And, and when you can put it, that, that true human lens, um, I, I think that that's when, when we really often go, oh, now, now I understand. Um, and Kim, if I could ask you to introduce yourself a little bit, please. Um, again, thank you very much for the opportunity to participate tonight. Um, this is a topic very near and dear to my heart. Um, so my name is Kim Kassir. I'm the oral health manager with Southwestern Public Health. Um, I manage their oral health program, and we have clinics located in St. Thomas and Woodstock. So I've had the pleasure of uh, managing um, dental hygienists and dental assistants and some contract dentists and program assistants, um, but we um, have the, I've had the uh, opportunity and pleasure of working at the Oxford County Community Health Center um, and we have um, the opportunity to have our seniors dental program um, run on Mondays and Tuesdays at that clinic. So um, I'm a dental hygienist by background. I've been in public health for over 20 years. Um, so I've seen um, the evolution of public health and uh, it's really exciting to see these issues come to the forefront and see how uh, oral health has um, gained um, recognition and it's really it's really a wonderful thing to see the great things that are happening at CHC. It is indeed and and I'm going to apologize to our wonderful panelists because I have completely messed up the order of questions. So after this point it's probably going to be just a free for all and we'll go from there. But I thought um you know, one of the things that you, you know if 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 you're reading a poster or a, a social me a media you know, posting about oral health and dental care. I, I think a lot of people would be reflecting on, you need to brush regularly, you need to floss, like it's all about pretty sparkling white teeth. It's about a lovely smile. Like it, and, and not to diminish, because we know you have to brush and we know you have to floss. So we'll put that out there for sure. Um, but but it's, it's, this conversation is not about pr the pretty part. Um, it really goes a whole lot deeper than that, and and it really um, impacts life and and all of the all of the pieces of life from employment to well being to to mental health and self esteem et cetera. And so, if I could just maybe start with um, how that really is, like what that actually looks like that. Poor oral health or, or really poor um, 
conditions in people's mouths really does impact all aspects of life of a person's life. Like I said, from employment to mental health, et cetera. And, and so it's not just, is it, do they have a pretty smile? It's, can they eat, can they eat real food and eat healthy food? And, and that I, I thought would be a good starting point. Cause I think it sets the stage for the rest of this conversation. So if I could, um, maybe ask uh, Abbas and Zach to just chime in with a little bit of that, what part we're talking about tonight and how it is sort of overwhelming in all aspects of life. Jump in, we'll start with Abbas, how's that? Thank you, Kelly. Um, and as you, you, you mentioned it quite well, uh, Kelly, to be honest, like it, impacts, oral health impacts every and any possible aspects of our lives, from our social interaction, from body image, how one perceives themselves, um, the eating habits, and so forth. Um, but I want to take a step back, and I want to reflect a little bit on when we talked about that we all know, yes, we're supposed to brush, we're supposed to floss, that's really obvious. We all have been um, talking about this, learning about this, hearing about this. But it's very interesting to see that the all the reason also we brush and floss and the way that we can we can we can have a behavior or have a lifestyle we can afford a brush mm -hmm. or toothpaste and able to brush that's also a privilege where a lot of our population do not have in our own backyard and this is something that have reflect that have repeatedly come forward in our uh, student reflection that are working in in, in the community center. Um, that, stood, that patients have expressed that if somebody had told me to brush 20 years ago, or if somebody, or if I had access to a cleaning, like a toothbrush and a toothpaste, then I might have saved my tooth or I might have saved my teeth. So all of that is very important. Second important, the second thing that I really want to emphasize here, that is not just about your teeth. And one thing that I mm. really try to steer away with my conversation is calling dental health or teeth. I talk about or we focus on more of oral health, right? Because when we talk about oral health, you're talking about a narrative where your mouth is a gateway to you in your body, right? So anything that enters in your body has to go through in your mouth. And anything that happens in your body could manifest in your mouth. So for instance, when we talk about since we are living in the time of COVID um, and epidemic. So in the last epidemic of HIV and AIDS, um, patients might not feel, might not um, get uh, uh, systemic manifestations of HIV, but when they went to their dentist, they were able to pick up the oral opportunistic infections, which could have been, could be due to HIV. So your mouth can signals, uh, can send signals um, um, for systemic problems that, that, that you might be encountering that, you know, you, your other healthcare providers could not really, really gauge. And I think this is where I think a dental profession is extremely, extremely underutilized, where when a patient comes to a dental office, we take a very comprehensive, detailed medical and dental history. We want to know from your head to your toe what's happening in your body so that we can, because everything interacts with our with the medication that we might be provided, with the materials we could be using. And more often than not, in fact, quite frequently, we screen for conditions that are missed for years. Let it be throat cancer, let it be skin cancers, let it be diabetes, let it be hypertension. So I think that's another importance of, 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 of uh, your oral health or uh, having some form of um, um, dental screening or preventive uh, checkups done. And this is why we need to expand uh, um, access to care to everyone and anyone. But I think I'll stop here and I'll, I'll, I'll let Zach to, to come in because I can speak about this all night. And as Zach comes in, I'm just going to say that, um, thank you, because I think that paints such a, an important picture of how everything truly is connected. Um, but for, for folks at home that may not realize um, over about 35% of our population have no access to um, em employee benefits, right? So about a fifth can't afford their the copay or the extra piece. Uh, over a third don't have any benefits. And then, as you said, the, things get significantly worse for those that are truly marginalized and barely 
uh, keeping a roof over their head or not, or food on their tables. So, so it really, it's important to look at all of these pieces. And Zach, what would you like to add to that part? Yeah, so I think, you know, we all know that there are, there's such power in, in a story, right? And so I'd just like to share like a testimony on an anecdote, but first I want to be mindful. We haven't totally kind of set the scene in terms of what available services look like in Oxford County quite yet. So just, just we'll touch on this more in time, but uh, at the Oxford County Community Health Center in partnership with the Western uh, Shulet School of Dentistry and Medicine, uh, we have been uh, running a clinic that provides services to those in Oxford County who don't otherwise have access. And that's been you know, through a piloting phase and then transitioning now into being more permanently scheduled program. And we're working to get the word out about our presence. Um, and, and so uh, as we've been providing those services, our, our wonderful students like, uh, like Roxy have been providing those services. Um, I've been, we've, been all, we've been able to talk to our clients and, and hear their stories. And I think this one just does such a good job of illustrating the impact of oral health on one's overall health and the impact of having available oral health services. So there's a few um, passages here that I'll work through that we can kind of deconstruct. So um, this woman told us that the CUNY Dental Clinic has been a savior. She, she mentioned that she used to avoid eating anything hard because it hurt so bad and it really limited her options for eating. Uh, after getting some work done, she felt she could eat a lot more without her teeth hurting so much. And she also has a lot more confidence in her teeth because they're cleaner and healthier looking. And her words, it doesn't look like they're about to fall out. Um, she mentioned that she used to, this is a really important part, a really interesting part. She mentioned that she used to pay hundreds to get teeth pulled because that was the only care that she could afford. Um, but even still for her, it was so hard to pay for those extractions and it could set her back for months financially. Um, and she mentioned that she finally has some peace of mind knowing that if something goes wrong with her teeth, she can actually get help. So there's that blanket of reassurance over top of her whole life that she can access services if and when she needs them. That just brings her uh, more at ease. And she says, I can get the work done that will save my teeth and hopefully keep them in my mouth wherever it's possible. I think that on so many levels illustrates the power, the importance of oral health and the power of availability of services for folks who haven't had it. Yeah, that, that's an interesting, my next question was going to be, how did we start as a community down this path? Um, but, you know, it makes me reflect back because we started a, close to a decade ago, United Way funded a pilot project um, to try and address some of this, um, this, this gap. It was a recognized gap. And we knew then that uh, that there were a lot of things happening in that there were through the addiction services work, there were people getting pain meds for infections, and but but no one was actually fixing the problem. Um, we knew that there were people who had their teeth pulled, but no help to get other teeth. And so it was affecting their diet. And I remember back, you know, again, about a decade ago, hearing that you know you don't need teeth to eat you can I remember hearing you can blend your food and thinking that's not right for anyone like it's just not right um and so do you is there anything you'd like to add um Zach about where this kind of started about a decade ago and then I think Abbas had his hand up yeah Abbas before I take us down a different road did you want to share something in relation to that so okay um so so yeah, I think it's uh, helpful, as you mentioned, Kelly, to kind of paint the history in terms of where, how this has come to be. And so I will need help from those on the panel though, because I, I wasn't present for most of it, admittedly, and I'm st definitely standing on the shoulders of giants and, and hours and hours and years of work. So I think you mentioned Kelly back as early as 2014 or 2015, um, the Oxford Oral Health Access Initiative, or UHI, um, was created as a um, kind of voluntary steering committee from a bunch of community partners that contributed to just the recognition of a need of the need for oral health care services in Oxford County. Um, and in 2016, uh, I believe that's when United Way uh, Oxford provided funding for a part time oral health project coordinator that kind of lead the way in completing a needs assessment of the needs across Oxford County. Um, by examining uh, the oral health needs of individuals with low income. Um, the working poor and seniors in Oxford County, 
as well as an exploration of like different models of service provision. So whether it was going to be like a mobile van that went out to the community or a volunteer clinic, clinic led by community minded dentists. And then in 2017, it was the decision of the steering committee that the, the, the most efficient model given, given the resources available would be uh, a clinic at the Oxford County Community Health Center. And uh, fortuitously in 2017 as well, um, there was a grant of $150,000 of upfront capital that was provided by Toyota Man uh, Motor Manufacturing Canada. And this was their largest grant, I believe on record to yes. community organization and went a long way towards um, providing uh, the capital to both retrofit fit the space um, at the Oxford County Community Health Center, as well as buy many of the costly um, dental tools and, and products that were required to, to provide the care. So in addition to this, um, the program received additional grants and private donations. So sources included the Ontario Children Foundation, uh, the Lions Club, uh, the iHeart Community Fund, 3M, as well as the Oxford County uh, Dental Society, among others. Have I missed anything to that point, Kelly, before I continue? I think you've done a great job. And, and I think it best. just shows, yeah, um, Randy will be proud because it, it shows how the stars really did align, that, that one thing led to another in, in such a perfect way to get us here today. Yeah, you're bang on. There was just so much goodwill from so many parties in order to get this off the ground. And it's been the case in order to continue it forward. So um, in comes Southwestern Public Health. So um, uh, w when was it, Kim, that the Seniors Dental Program was announced by the Ontario government, 2018, I think? Um, it came in, <clears throat> excuse me, it came into being uh, the fall of 2019. Gotcha, yeah. And so the, uh, Ontario government announced funding for um, a dental program specifically for seniors and uh, Southwestern Public Health in Oxford County um, became the administrator of that program and so got some upfront capital to establish a program and um, at that point a memorandum of understanding between the Oxford County Community Health Centre and Southwestern Public Health was created whereby Southwestern Public Health brought some capital to, to finish the second operatory in our dental clinic provided and provided additional um, tools and supplies as well as expertise. Um, and then um, we then allowed them to uh, run their clinic out of our, out of our or run their program out of our clinic um, two days a week while we used it for the other three. So that kind of leads us uh, to approaching the end state, which was that the clinic is used three days a week by the Oxford County Community Health Center Community Dental Clinic and two days a week by Southwestern Public Health Seniors Dental Program. Both programs serve slightly different populations, which we'll talk about more down the line. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, it was at this point that um, the uh, Oxford County Community Health Center uh, came in partnership with the Schulich School of Medicine and Dentistry um, to incorporate clinical rotations into the curriculum for fourth year dental students. And this started as a pilot program where dental students came, um, Roxy being one of those dental students in the pilot to the center uh, to provide services for a short period of time. We, you know, experimented, learned, learned from uh, what, we, what we saw, had a second pilot, and then now as of September, have become a regularly scheduled uh, program. So all fourth, is it correct to say of us that all fourth year um, dental students now um, rotate through the clinic for a minimum of a week in their final year of study to provide service to the community? That's what I'm going to circle back to that. Um, but Zach, I think what you did a beautiful job of, of showing is how the partners, so, so, you know, luck doesn't just create itself. And even though star, I always say the stars align, the stars align because people do all of the hard work and the heavy lifting to make them align. And then those opportunities do present. And so, um, Kim, if maybe we could just swing over to you before we go back um, to hear more about mm -hmm. Shuluk and, and what that connection is. But if you, would you tell us a little bit about 
Um, so th there's the, the dental program for low-income seniors, uh, which are running out of the Oxford County Community Health Center. But you also have Southwest Public Health also has some other dental programs and oral health care programs um, as well. Could you just maybe touch on some of those for folks? Sure. Sure. So we're um, public health units are mandated to provide various um, programs and services. Under school health, we provide um, dental screening and surveillance in the schools. Uh, so we visit elementary schools um, and we collect data surveillance on the oral health of the children in, in Oxford and Elgin counties. And then we also screen children for urgent decay. Um, so if we identify a child with um, cavities, large cavities. Um, we send information home to parents to explain about the Healthy Smiles Ontario program. So that's the uh, children's program for Ontario children. Um, it's for children zero to up until the age of 18. Um, and it's a um, basic program um, that covers urgent um, dental care. Um, Again, it's across the province um, and all health units are mandated to provide those services. Under chronic disease, um, we um, are providing the Ontario Seniors Dental Care Program. So that was a new program that just came in prior to the pandemic. Um, so many health units just started to get up and running and then with the pandemic were shut down, but um, most are up and running. Um, that's a low income program for seniors, 65 and over. Um, they must um, complete um, an application and have filed their income tax and they're assessed um, at the ministry level. And if they qualify, they receive a card that's good for one year. Um, it's a little different than the Healthy Smiles program. Children on Healthy Smiles can visit their dental care provider of their choice. Um, the seniors um, don't have that opportunity. Um, they either see, see treatment in a public health unit or in a community health center. Um, so our seniors are able to access the program uh, in Oxford at the CHC or in our dental clinics in St. Thomas. Um, and yeah, that's basically um, the three major programs that, that we deliver to uh, um, help individuals in, across the province. Um, but sadly, we don't really have anything for people that are um, 18 to 64. So. Well, one, one step at a time. Mm -hmm. um, and just a little comment that for folks um, that are, you know, struggling and maybe they haven't submitted their income tax for a few years or they don't have the right ID or, or there are organizations and there are groups that will help community health center team being one of them. They will help people kind of get those ducks in a row so that they can get to the supports that they need. Um, so I, I think... Um, Abbas, if we can go back to you and, and really, I think, learn a little more about why this matters so much to Shulik um, and, and what, what the impact is, and then definitely segue to Roxy to hear from her personal experience um, in the, on the ground, if you will, um, in, the, in the clinic in, in Woodstock. So, Abbas? So, firstly, it's... As a primary care provider, it's it is our responsibility to look out for to uh, for the well-being of the people who cannot access healthcare, right? So, it's we must do that. We should do that. We can do a better job. Um, so, firstly, that it's very very important that we own this responsibility. We reinstate and revive our social contract um, with the profession and with the people that we are training to serve um, and dentistry unfortunately has not done a great great job in in realizing their role as a primary care providers and and has you know traditionally acquired more of a business model and business kind of a role in, 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 a, in, in a society um, for various reasons which I'm not going to get into but as an academic institution it gives us this opportunity and freedom that we can do the things the right way without getting into the business and the profit aspects of things. Obviously, we have to be mindful and we have to generate funds and whatnot. But, but despite of that, we have this luxury that we can um, go by the books and do things the right way. And, and it's important that we do send a message that we care 
and it fall, falls on our shoulders that if you are unable to access oral care or medical care, then it's our responsibility, our social and moral responsibility to reach out to you uh, as opposed to sit in our fancy office, air conditioned, heated offices and, 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 and expensive Dell chairs and wait for patients to come in. So firstly that. Secondly, I think it's very important for an academic institution like Schulich to actually train our, dental our future dental professions and expose them to these um, psychosocial disparities and see how the oral health is connected to so many different, different problems. So we were talking about financial affordability um, in our earlier part of this conversation, that how affordability is a, is a big driver of access to care, which is very true, but also it's not true as well. Because we know that stigma and discrimination is also another a big inhibitor of access to dental care. Mm -hmm. um, indigenous population community members, for instance, have robust um, dental insurances, but yet they continue to have much higher oral health care problems than um, other Canadians. So, so financial affordability is not always linked with access to care, but at the same time, your dental care provider's attitude, uh, body language, uh, empathy, um, able to relate with one's personal story and life journey could be the driver of building that trust within the healthcare system that our populations usually loses while they interact with, um, with the healthcare providers. And this is why a big focus of our outreach program is to look also into the evidence-based approach. We are not, uh, or that's something that I'm extremely, extremely <laughs> firm about, that we are not there to provide a band-aid solution. We are not there to drill and fill. And especially, Kelly, in the current uh, Canadian context where we are so diverse and we value our diversity and we have people coming from all different walks of life and all different situations and all different countries and all different cultures. We need to understand the, this, this uh, uh, element of individual, individual, individuality in our patients and then treat them according to what they individually need as opposed to treating all um, um, teeth in one way. So a person who has developed a cavity because because of eating fast food versus somebody who is coming from a war-torn country with the same condition could be because of all various reasons, right? So we need to train our students to be aware of that person-centered approach. And here I would say person-centered approach, not patient-centered approach. We're also passing the era where we consider a living being as a disease and focus on the disease. Um, so we are passing that era and we're getting, we are more, and dentistry again has not done a good job in, in catching up with, with this idea. Medicine has, has done a way better job in, in implementing the person-centered model and person-centered approach, but we're a little late, but we're, we're catching up. You're coming so, to the party. Exactly. We are. <laughs> so we want to, we want to, um, look into the individualized risk factors, uh, of our patients and see what we can do to help to eradicate those um, risk factors. Um, uh, with the new dental program coming up, there is a threshold of, of um, household income that you need certain household income to apply uh, for $600 uh, per year for your kids. But lots of these families, lots of these people who actually need dental care don't have mediums to apply for tax returns, right? So. I think a dental student first should be helping them to file taxes before treating their teeth, right? So this is the kind of thinking we need our students to, to, uh, to develop while they're in dental schools, that yes, they're oral care providers, but their role is much wider and much bigger um, in that capacity. And I love that because that really reflects, I think, on the way so many of our, our partners and, and service organizations here in the county and I'm, I'm sure elsewhere really work together that 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 people see it as a role and it's sort of that wraparound approach um, and some organizations can take a piece and another organization can take another piece because um, life can be overwhelming and navigating any system can be overwhelming and so if people do need a couple of other pieces in place in order to access these wonderful programs 
then, then it's up to us as a community to make sure those pieces are in place. And, and part of this conversation and the reason we do this is so that people can know that some of those programs are indeed in place. And this is how you can get to them, right? And this is how this can help move that forward. Um, and I also love that it's very much relationship-based and, and building trust. Um, because one of the things that United Way Oxford hears when we go out and talk to people across our community is um, they, they want to... They want supports in a timely, local, accessible manner that's really relationship-based. Like that matters to people. And it really matters when people are feeling particularly vulnerable or are vulnerable um, and, and trust and, and relationships go a long way. So Roxy, can we swing over to you and maybe hear a little bit about your experience on the ground in, in the... Uh, in the suites, the dental suites over at the Community Health Center. For sure. I, I do want to touch though on uh, some of the concepts that you guys mentioned, like being just the dental component piece in the Oxford County community um, is only a small part of it. Like Dr. Jasani said, we need to have, for example, an accountant maybe on hand also who can help people file taxes. And it really speaks to the need for um, interprofessional collaboration, which I feel like at Shulik, I'm very fortunate. Our curriculum focuses a lot on this and um, has really taught us the, the value of it. And then Oxford County really gave me an opportunity to see it in practice, like being able to see a patient who just came in from uh, the health clinic side where they saw their physician and had so-and-so treatment rendered, um, and then to come here and say, well, now I need help with the dental side because I'm not able to perhaps have the diet I need to take care of my overall health. And, and that's because of my um, oral health condition. So um, that interprofessional collaboration piece is, is huge and the Oxford County community lives and breathes it. That's what they're doing um, under one roof, which um, speaks to the power of it. And uh, the other piece um, Dr. Jasani also touched on is the trust. So something I experienced firsthand uh, at the clinic over and over again, um, where patients saying, I don't like the dentist, I don't trust the dentist, <laughs> um, I don't want to be here kind of thing, but I know I need help. And a lot of time, which we're fortunate to have, like our appointments aren't constrained by, um, you know, needs to like 30 minutes or whatever, we can, we can take time, two hours, three hours, whatever the need is. Um, so we're like, afforded the opportunity to spend time with the patient and get to know them in and outside of the dental context, um, which surprisingly and more often than not can, as a practitioner, give you an idea of, okay, well, you know, it's not just this that needs treatment. It's like, if we can help you get, say, like Dr. Chani said, a toothbrush, or if we can help you get the knowledge on um, how to better brush your teeth, well, now you can avoid having this oral health disease uh, take hold and that can help you um, with your nutrition or your quality of life. Um, a lot of individuals who come through the clinic are in pain and have been in pain for a while. And um, that's just their status quo, which is hard to, hard to see. It's not, you don't want anyone living in discomfort, but it's a reality for many individuals. And so being afforded that uh, opportunity to help them uh, have a new status quo is really special. And I'm very thankful for the clinic that is at Oxford County um, because it is unique and it's not something we can do, not right now, it's not something we can do across the province in an, in an instant. It, it takes time and effort, like you said, to pull all the resources and people um, to get it in motion. Yeah. But we keep trying, we keep, you know, plucking away and adding and building um, and enhancing the supports and Definitely. services. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And, and that's actually a good segue again to my questions that are in no order or, or <laughs> not in the order you had. Um, but, <laughs> but it was really about, you know, sometimes people might think, well, there's the, this is maybe an expensive program to run. Um, mm -hmm. but, but the flip side is it would be more expensive, frankly, to not run it. Um, there is a there yeah. is a major cost, a, a societal cost, an employment cost, 
um, a health care cost um, for all of this. And so um, would anyone like to maybe chime in a little bit on um, the impact of, of like emergency room visits and how, you know, what sort of some of the history might be on how much that costs and if we could proactively, you know, use those dollars um, for, for that greater good um, where people can get some help. So does anyone want to weigh in on, on the impact on healthcare in particular? I can maybe, um, I know back in 2014, 15, when we were advocating for dental programs and again, um, policy, you know, public policy, you know, you look for policy windows and opportunities. And um, back in 2014, um, we had um, been given the information that it was around $513 a visit for someone to go to an emergency room in Ontario. And they multiplied that by the number of, you know, patients that had gone. Um, and they were saying that, you know, that an estimated cost for dental visits to ER in Ontario was at least 31 million. And that was back in 2014. So I'm certain it's much higher now. Um, so again, it's not an effective way of usage of our healthcare dollars. Um, and again, you know, they leave with luckily, hopefully a prescription, um, painkillers, and again, not, nothing's resolved, so. And that's just it. It doesn't get resolved. It's not fixed for the individual that's suffering. It's just maybe, maybe if they're lucky, band-aid it so to speak. Absolutely. And also these conditions don't develop overnight. These can be, these, that extreme case where a person needs to be, needs to be seen in an emergency room is a result of years of, of neglect um, because of various reasons, right? So if we can get to these people in earlier uh, phase um, and come together as a profession and as a public health unit together, um, then these conditions can be like, I would say 95% of the times can be very much prevented, you know? Um, but just because of um, the lack of access to dental care, lack of access to dental education, um, we see these extreme cases or extreme numbers. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, still a dental student, but I, I do want to add that something I've learned already in my short time uh, in the field is the most affordable care really is preventative care. Um, and that's what both Kim and Dr. Jasani have alluded to. Um, even just providing oral hygiene uh, instruction, as we like to call it, or education at, at the early ages in elementary school, something we've done before with some of the other um, outreach programs at Shulik, like that can make a big difference and set someone up for life. Um, it's at the um, Oxford County community, the amount of times someone said like, I wish I had known how to brush this way instead of that way. I was doing it wrong and like worsening the condition or maybe leading or setting myself up for a different condition to establish um, is just, it, it was shocking, uh, but it really speaks to the power of prevention. And I just wanted to add that. Mm -hmm. It speaks to the power of prevention. It also speaks to the power to the profession mm -hmm the providers as well, right? The impact that you can make in one's life um, by just spending two minutes on how to brush and floss. Like two to five minutes, that's all it takes. Very important. Um, so maybe we can segue over to a little bit about like the specifics of some of the, the, the programs or, or the, the actual care that's being provided. So it's, it's more than checkups, it's more than cleanings, that you sort of are running the gamut and I think adding all the time. But would someone like to, to speak about the variety of supports and services um, that are happening through the lab or through the, the dental suite at the community health center and, and, and how it's meeting various needs of, of folks across our community? Don't all jump at once. I can maybe speak to that, what's happening with the seniors, the Ontario yeah. Seniors Dental Care Program. Um, it's, it's actually a very, very nice program for seniors. Um, again, it has basic preventive care, restorative, 
um, there is um, oral surgery. Um, so if someone needs a tooth extracted, if someone needs a root canal, um, it doesn't cover things like implants, um, bridges, it, it will cover a crown. Um, I believe um, a yearly checkup, um, a fair amount of time for cleanings. Um, the other nice thing about that program is that we have a denture program and many of these seniors are so happy to get dentures. Um, there is a very small copay um, so at the very most, uh, a senior may be expected to pay less than $80 for a full upper and wow. lower. Um, so that's really gratifying to see people. We actually have a denturist on staff and um, they are just so thrilled to be able to smile again and eat again, you know. Um, so that's, that's a nice aspect of this program that we have. Um, but, that, you know, I, again, for low income seniors, um, probably the vast majority of us don't actually even appreciate how expensive some of these programs and services are, how expensive the process of getting dentures can be. And so for some, you know, it may as well be a million dollars versus whatever it is, because it's just unattainable, right? When, when it's, you know, a decision of putting food on the table or paying the rent or something else, there's just no extra for for far too many, and and more now, uh, sadly, than than previously. Mm -hmm. um, so so what about um, for through the other program through the community health center program yeah. um, in partnership with Schulich? What about more of those sort of full all encompassing services, Zach? Yeah, so I'll start more generally, and then I will speak uh, defer to the dental professionals. I didn't caveat this whole conversation by saying I, I'm not a professional, a dental professional by training, nor do I pretend to be. I don't even have the vernacular to to say what needs to be said. But just, just speaking generally, Kim, thanks for for sharing what's provided or what's available for folks, you know, who who would be a senior, and then. Uh, our program, uh, the Oxford County Community Health Center Community Dental Clinic, is meant to serve um, folks under 65 who are who identify as low income, so have challenges meeting basic needs, and um, otherwise don't have access to dental benefits through through whatever is available. Um, that that's who we're meant to serve. So we're really meant to be that net underneath all the other available services that catches anyone else who needs it in Oxford County. And um, we provide a range of, of different services to um, the, the people that we serve. And I'll defer to Boss and, and Rocky to explain what those are. And then I'll uh, set the stage for what's on the horizon as well, because they're always okay. evolving, like you mentioned. Perfect. I will let Roxy to speak a bit about it because I want to give more power to students. So, and then I'll 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 fill in the gaps. Um, well, as far as the services uh, provided, very similar to what Kim said, there's a full spectrum from a whole new patient exam, uh, general checkups, restorative work, um, endodontics, which is the root canal treatment, um, which is an alternative to extractions in some indicated situations, and then of course the oral surgery uh, component. I think the main limitation right now, which I think is where Zach is going to go, uh, is the prosthodontic uh, care, which includes dentures and crowns and bridges, et cetera, um, which is the actual replacement of any missing teeth uh, or restoration of function. Um, I think that's an area that as students, we, we did see many individuals who came in with teeth that just had what we call a hopeless prognosis. Unfortunately, there wasn't any restorative that could be done. And so the only step there is to extract. Um, but then we ran into a barrier where um, there was no next step. Okay, well now how do we replace the teeth? Um, and so I think that's where the program is working on building out. Um, but otherwise, the, the clinic is fully stocked, fully like updated uh, with the industry standard equipment and technology, and the students are ready and able to help fill the need for that um, age group that isn't caught by the other um, government programs that we've discussed already. So that's really where the, the need is filled by the Oxford Dental Clinic. Um, yeah, I'll let Dr. Jasani and uh, Zach add to that. <laughs> Thank you, Roxy. So pretty much everything you said, that's absolutely correct. Um, and then just to add on that now we are working with, with Zach and um, um, the executive director of uh, the community center who 
really think it's no less than a Superman, um, Randy, um, to actually come up with a plan on how to uh, provide the prosthetic help, um, meaning dentures, um, to the to uh, the um, to the patients there as well. Um, at the same time, we also are going to be piloting another service, another dental service at the community side, which is going to be specialized oral surgery clinics now, which will be piloting twice a month starting January, where we have one of our um, really pristine alumni who have come forward um, to offer his expertise in oral surgery department and um, assist the community members and community centers with complicated um, a surgical needs that a population uh, might have. So that's also being piloted at the community site starting next month. And I see that um, Randy and Zach and our, our um, Shulik um, adjunct, Dr. John Mahan, they're working very diligently in actually getting the logistics and the infrastructure um, in place. So I think now we are going, at least want to believe that and I'm sure I'm, I'm, I hope I'm right that the word is getting out and it's exactly and then people and our, 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 our community members and our, our other adjunct faculty members, um, and they're coming forward to help, they're coming forward to assist because they all see the value both from the population and from the student training perspective. So in terms of services, yes. Um, this is how um, we are expanding our services. Um, there are some limitations here um, because of the way we have student scheduling and the, the academic calendar, which is not in our control of, at all because it's all governed by the university. So that's why we have some hesitations and limitations on what we can offer in terms of the fixed prosthetics um, treatment. But definitely removable prosthetics, meaning dentures, are uh, under discussions. And that's something that we are really hoping to, to implement uh, in the next coming months. Excellent. We, we know that's a major gap. Zach, I'm turning it back over to you. Yeah, just something um, that's very important to acknowledge in that conversation around you know, our move to be toward being able to offer uh, our clients dentures is an acknowledgement of Chris Powell and his team over at Powell Laboratories, who we have been in conversation with. Um, they've really gone above and beyond to provide us with a fee structure that will allow us to provide the service for clients in the uh, the near to medium term, medium term future. So again, I think this just speaks to you know, everyone pulling together and that, uh, I know the term United Way uses collective impact of everyone pulling in the same direction. It does mm -hmm. feel like we're at a, a turning point uh, here where everyone's really coming together and realizing that, that we need to take action. It's such an important, it's such a, it, there, it has been such a gap in service, such an important need and so all consuming for the individuals um, impacted. You know, we've said from the beginning, whether it's um, employment or self-esteem, mental health, physical health, heart health, all of those things. But, you know, often we'll hear people say, well, you know, someone, could, if they could get a job, then their 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 situation would, would change and things could improve. And, and that indeed may be case. The, uh, but one of the things that we all know is um, in order to get a job, one often has to go through interview processes um, and even, you know, um, as a simple position where, you know, you're greeting customers. Those are those are really important roles. And the expectation is that you're smiling and greeting customers, you know, immediately upon you know, entry into it. So, so it really does have an economic toll, an emotional toll, all of those pieces. Um, Zach, are there any other barriers that that um, that come to mind? I mean, we talked about it. It may be financial. It is not always financial, um, but there are other pieces. Um, and but I think it's a great segue for some of the work that the CHC also does. For instance, like uh, outreach and and um, transportation. Yeah, thank you, Kelly. That's a great point. And and you know, we do call ourselves right. Our name is the Oxford County Community Health Center, and we serve all of Oxford County, both more urban and rural centers. And we do have a, uh, of course, a, a satellite or a, a point of access in Tilsonburg, as well as another in Woodstock. And um, but but we fully recognize that transportation 
is a huge barrier for many people, right? For for all the reasons that we've described and that we know well. And so, you know, part of our vision as a community health center is to to break down barriers and to be a catalyst for change. And part of the way that we do that is to um, provide transportation services for folks, uh, either through uh, transportation, either by volunteers or staff using our generously donated Toyota RAV um, from Toyota Motor Manufacturing Corporation Canada, uh, or um, through paying for folks to take cabs to appointments, including to our Center for Dental Care, um, or to you know, support folks financially in accessing any of the more um, uh, traditional means of transportation. Uh, so I think that the transportation barrier can be a huge one and anyone who feels they're experiencing that and accessing any of our services, we, we do have a way to overcome it and we're, we're happy to support people in doing that. Uh, so I think that's just one example. It's a good one. And, and you know, um, historically, um, pre, pre, you know, the, the launch of, of this wonderful program, um, often people here would be referred to um, some of the community outreach programs that were provided specifically at the Shilluk Dental School, and, and they would have to go to London. Um, but that that comes with even bigger challenges as far as the transportation piece and, and the, the whether people or not are comfortable going onto the campus and and the parking and all of those pieces. Um, and it could it really was a barrier for so many folks. Um, so so there was a, an opportunity to access some better help or op, but but then the barriers on the on the flip side. So very, very important. Um, Roxy, can I go back to you? I have two questions. One, I'm going to ask you if you will um, maybe share a couple of stories from your experience. But before you do that, can you tell me how this experience will impact your professional career going forward? Um, I mean, it's hard to say exactly the uh, the downfall, but I can tell you that community service has been near and dear to my heart throughout my education, even before uh, dental school. And um, I think one of the things that wasn't really obvious to me um, in my first couple of years of dental school is just how much opportunity there is to do community outreach in dentistry. Um, it didn't really seem like such a big public health sector, but there's definitely is the need and it's definitely growing. So there is a lot of opportunity there to help and be part of it. And I can't imagine not being part of it um, just because it's something, like I said, it's it's always been near and dear to me. So I think um, just knowing that clinics like the Oxford Community Clinic, um, County Community Clinic are there and that there is a need for say, um, I don't, I don't know if they're called faculty, but just members to come help and supervise students or just members that can come support and maybe advise makes it a no brainer that that's an opportunity for us to get involved as clinicians um, and give back to our community. I love that. Abbas? Sorry, what was your question again? Um, I, I think how, how what the uh, impact is on lifelong, the profession of life, you know, the experience um, and how the expectation, I think, is it will, it will really resonate and stick with some of your students. I, and, and that's the hope. And this is why, um, as I said earlier, we, I strongly believe in evidence-based um, teaching and evidence-based um, uh, uh, treatments and evidence-based dentistry, and this is exactly where we have actually we have secured our first federal tri-council grant um, from um, the, the the Shirk grant um, with the support of of the community centers, the first partnership grant that we received, and this is exactly what we'll be evaluating in the next few months that how these rotations are um, impacting the empathy and perspective taking from the student's perspective and also from the service user's perspective. And we have all different bunch of theories to analyze our data and I'm not gonna bore you and the audience with those theories right now. But this is exactly what our goal is to investigate in the years coming forward that how is this program going to impact the way we, we practice dentistry. And I think this is uh, a very unique time to launch this program because now we have a national dental plan plan coming forward as well 
So, I mean, we, we have very limited information about it, but I would want to imagine and I want to be very optimistic that there would be some kind of public dollars available for some preventative uh, basic dental care where, um, where I really, really hope that it is available, uh, dentistry and or preventive dental care is available for everyone and anyone. And it's not just um, um, a commodity for people who can actually afford it. So once that program also rolls out, then I think a lot of things that we do would also uh, be positively impacted uh, by that program, I hope. Um, so where we can link uh, our service learning to what will be available, hopefully from the public side and from the federal government side as well. Yeah, I'll jump in just with a final thought. Yeah, I, so I do come from an educational background as well. And I'm a physiotherapist by training and then taught at the School of Physiotherapy at McGrath University. And what we saw time and time again is the experiences that students, professional students have during their education very much guide their career path. Um, and, you know, I'm an example of that. I had a, a placement just by happenstance at a community health center. And here I am. Um, 10 years later. And so I, I think and hope that by taking every single student that goes through the, med the dentistry program at Schulich um, into this setting can only serve to you know, increase the community mindedness of our future dentists um, and, and the, the people who will be interested in, in, in trying to advocate for programs like what we're offering and, and for equity in dental services. That, that's that's fantastic. Uh, we do have a couple of questions and I, I want to make sure that we leave some room um, for anyone who wishes to share a couple of stories because again, I, I think the stories can often really um, pull together all of the comments to and make it very real for folks. Um, but one in particular, the first question is, what is the future vision of the dental and oral health services at the um, Oxford County Community Health Center. So Zach, I'm thinking that month maybe should go your way. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a loaded question and uh, one that I will answer sheepishly, but I, I think our vision, like if we're thinking big V vision is, you know, equi equitable access uh, to all to, to oral health care services for all in Oxford County, right? That's the, that's the aim. But I think our first step needs to be to sustainably fund the programs that we're currently offering. And I think this is where- that's the next question. You know, yeah, I think this is where we can call to action anyone who, who is listening or will listen to this webinar to you know lobby your MPPs and your MPs and talk about the need for access to oral, oral health care services in your community just to kind of continue this momentum and the start of this wave that's began developing. Um, because, you know, we, we were saying just before this, this we press record, there's a reason why people don't try to provide <laughs> dental services to folks for free, because it's really difficult and the structure is not there, mm -hmm. right? In terms of the way that they're funded in terms of, you know, support from government, et cetera. And so um, it's really, really hard right now. And in any way that you can help to kind of continue that conversation, I encourage folks to, to engage in. To add, to add on what Zach's saying, I think another important component from my side, from the Schulich side, would be to, A, firstly, yes, further strengthen the program that we're currently offering. Um, I think a new oral surgery development uh, or clinic is, is further um, a testament to, to our commitment um, for further strengthening um, the tertiary or the secondary and tertiary services that we are, down services that we are, we are committed to provide through our student rotations. But once I think uh, after this, when we have hopefully in the next couple of years, when we have a good structure in place at CHC, then I think our next step would be to actually take a step further and focus on prevention. Uh, of strong value that I see in our education, um, where we have not uh, we have not really capitalized on that is to take our students early on when they start year one to community outreach. We don't need to wait until the year four to provide care. That should happen year one, term one. So perhaps I'm thinking out loud um, is taking our students to some local community schools in Oxford County and other south southwestern uh, Ontario to take our students to uh, long-term care facilities, to other community centers 
And these, these could be perhaps first and second year students that could talk about um, healthy eating habits, um, oral health and oral education and hygiene, engaging parents and caregivers, engaging long-term care nurses. Mm -hmm. um, we, another important big population is our geriatric population, our aging population. And we know how COVID further um, highlighted the problems that we have in our long-term care facility system and lack of care rates and support system. What do you think happens with the oral health of those individuals? If you have to change one's nappies and brush their teeth, guess, what, guess what's going to uh, get neglected, right? Yeah. So, so the goal will be to then engage our, our dental students in those community outreach, in those capacities and work on, work on prevention. Another important, important uh, um, um, aspect that it's so alienating in, in North American education is including non-dental providers with some basic dental education. So in a community where you don't have a dentist or dental hygienist, you might have a physiotherapist or you have a pharmacist. Can they do basic oral screening for us? Can they talk about brushing and flossing or can do basic screening and refer these patients to, to the closest um, offices? So I think the vision uh, can be really broad and, and, we, and the determination that we have seen from from the office, from the CHC, um, I think we can make it happen. Uh, <laughs> if we can make this happen, I think we can make the next steps happen as well. The second question was in regards to sustainability of the program. So I think there, in my thought, there are two ways that I would envision it to happen. First um, is to knock every door possible for, 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 for um, funds. And so far we have been, uh, Again, luck, but the luck came with lots and lots of grant writing and lots and lots of um, um, hard work that went into it or is going into it. So we are, we are, we have developed a momentum. But I think second important opportunity of sustaining this program will be the rollout of national. I hope so, the national dental program, as well. mm -hmm. because this would be, I think, an opportunity to have actually connecting those with those two program and make uh, make it more or uh, make it more sustainable. And there was another question as well, the third one. Oh, it was, how do we make it a model for Ontario since this is a very unique partnership serving mm -hmm. those who truly need service? And, and, and that really is at the heart of it. It is people who truly need service who otherwise would not have any service. Mm -hmm. So I think our work is speaking for itself. Um, the fact that it is getting momentum and just by being here today and talking about it, right? I mean, the reason we're talking about it because we have something to say about it, right? Um, so I think that's that's the first step. Um, an adjunct coming up to us and asking us to do an, another additional oral surgery day without any cost, without any remuneration, that shows the, the potential of how we can further expand our services. Um, and that's just one um, one um, opportunity that I'm talking about. I mean, I have received several other requests, but at the same time, I'm very cautious about what we do because I, we don't want to spread our spread ourselves too thin and get into uh, get into um, unwarranted situations, right? Mm -hmm. So I think making the model. I think we've already started that journey. I think we have already uh, we're already um, on the right path of making that model and. And I think at, at some point we will have to be more vocal about what we are doing um, in our presentations, in our conference presentations. One of the things that I will be uh, doing moving on would be uh, the research aspect, highlighting it through the research aspect where engaging students, clinicians, staff workers. So the project that we are doing now, um, with the support of CSC, we are engaging our students, they will be interviewed, they will be doing focus groups, um, the patients will be doing focus groups, the community staff members, the stakeholders will be fo doing focus groups and filling out surveys and whatnot, right? So, so bringing people together, those papers will be published um, in reputable journals, I hope, um, will be presented in on local international conferences. So, um, but obviously it will take time, right? Rome wasn't built in a day. So. But it builds the case. Absolutely. And it, it really does. It lays the foundation to build the case. And, and the fact that this is not, um, oral health care is, is not something that should be considered a luxury. It is something that, that 
um, people have a right to, absolutely. Um, one thing before, I, if I, if I oh, may, yes. I'm sorry, I'm, I, this is something that I strongly feel about and I want to take this platform as an opportunity, is to again, re-emphasize and focus on prevention. And on really the next few years, I would really hope that with, so Schulich Dentistry is also revamping our dental curriculum, and it happens to fall under my supervision or my leadership as well. So one of our main goal, or my goal will be to take our students out of the protected walls of Schulich into the community from year one and day one. And I really hope that we are expanding this prevention program, expand this prevention program within the other community organizations, such as schools, churches, um, any any community platforms where you have people, where you have the sense of community and taking our students um, to do prevention. And our students do an amazing job. Like, it's objectively speaking, um, they are really well liked and they're very well loved by, of course, most of them, <laughs> by the community, that they are the people they interact with. So, so I think if and when that happens, that will be a win-win situation for all of us. Wonderful. Okay. I'm, I, I'd like to circle back to a, a story or two on, on what the impact really is. And I think you all have stories. Um, but would someone like to share, I, I obviously, without, you know, the specific details of an individual, but, but I, I think it really matters when people can kind of have those aha moments to go, I see why, why that truly could help change a life. Would anyone like to jump in on that? Roxy, do you have a, who's, who's your most memorable person that you helped from your time with us? I, uh, <laughs> who's your most memorable? What's that? Sorry, Dr. Desani. I said, other than Zach, who's your most memorable person? Oh. Now I'm <laughs> blushing. Now I'm blushing. Now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I struggled to pick a story. I know you kept, um, like prompting me to. And, and honestly, it's very challenging to pick just one patient, uh, wow. because every single person that walked through the door was so unique and the challenges they faced were their own and the things that we could help them through brought them their own successes. So really like I am struggling to pick one, um, for what I can. That was a beautiful answer though, Roxy. <laughs> like really, it, it was truly beautiful. I mean, I'd like to answer the question, but yeah, I, I really can't. I can speak to themes uh, that I did see repeated um, more frequently, but yeah, it, it's really hard to just pick one. Um, Do you want to mention a couple of those? Because again, I think it gives good context for folks. Yeah, and I feel like we alluded to a, um, a lot of the stuff I might say now throughout the conversation we've had tonight, but like, um, okay, where do I start? <laughs> many stories started with, I haven't seen a dentist in 20 years. Um, many individuals who sat in the chair had a similar opening line. And that to me was just like, wow, okay. Like, have you spoken to anyone about your oral health? Has you, have you spoken to a physician? Have you spoken to in the emergency room? Like, no, like I don't, I don't talk about my oral health or I haven't considered it in 20 years. I haven't had time to think about it because X, Y, Z has been in the way, or I don't trust the dentist, or I, some barrier that's there that we might not have known about until they came into our chair and, and started the discussion with us. Um, so that was something that really like stuck with me. Um, and I know there were a couple of patients too, who, um, because I was there for four weeks um, total, I was able to see some repeat uh, patients and one uh, in particular had come to us um, currently unemployed and they were struggling um, to secure just basic housing and, and um, like food and resources. Um, and through our time and working with them, they managed to get a job and managed to change some of the circumstances around their socioeconomic situation. Um, and part of that journey included us, like, honestly, like you said, helping with their smile, helping with their confidence. Um, the, the emotions around dental care was like, I just don't like myself anymore. And I don't like, um, you know, how my day-to-day -day is going because of the situation. So 
everyone's story is unique, but there are definitely themes where it's painfully obvious uh, that access to care is like a first step and having a clinic and members who are able to bring that access is I think what it's all about and why we're all here. <laughs> For sure. Kim, is there anything you would like to add with a, a senior lens perhaps? You're on mute. Still on mute. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, we have a huge wait list for the seniors program. It's, it's very popular and um, it's sometimes very difficult to put people on waiting lists. Um, but today we were able to get a couple in and um, they were so happy. And at the end of the day, the gentleman and usually sometimes seniors aren't very techy, um, but the gentleman sent us a lovely email um, complimenting our staff and uh, that they were professional and um, it, it just it was glowing. It just made my whole day and sent it to the director. And uh, yeah, so it's just it's so gratifying to be able to help people. Just really awesome. Mm -hmm. I think you know people probably don't associate dental or a healthcare with social services, but, but I mean, that, that is really, you know, we say all the time in the United Way world, it takes a village that, that we're all part of the village, but we all need to be part of the village in order to help. Um, and, uh, you know, I think you've given so many examples this evening of not just what you and your own teams are doing to help, but all of the extra pieces that, that can help like lift people up and give them the additional supports or the additional connections to the, the pieces that, that might also be lacking, but, but where there is help and, and things can, can improve. Mm -hmm. So we're going to, we have just a two, a two or three minutes. Um, so I'll just open it up to see if anyone has something that they would like to share that they haven't yet had an opportunity to. Before I, I run, run out of time, I really would take the opportunity to acknowledge um, the executive director, Randy, and the former coordinator of the program, Joanne Orton, for doing an exemplary, amazing job in putting to get things together. And here, here. Infrastructure, every, like I have honestly no words. Um, and this is, we were only able to do what we're able to do because I always say that it's about the environment. If the environment is enabling, then you grow and you give your best. So the team at CHC, especially the leadership, and now Zach is, is, is carrying forward the same, uh, the task with even more and if not more than at least same same passion, enthusiasm and, and, and whatnot. So, so I really want to mention Randy and, and Joanne for laying such a strong foundation and everyone else um, who actually helped them out um, in carrying this task and building this task forward. I agree. You know, when we first started, when United Way first started funding, sitting on the committee, then subsequently funding Joanne's position and, and then helping, you know, as, as things have moved on. And um, we used to say we were doing this one on a bit of a wing and a prayer, um, but it really, you know, kind of going back to the stars really have aligned and and piece by piece and year by year things continue to 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 fall into place but that that's not effortless it falls into place because it's had fantastic leadership and incredible support and and concern and a commitment to do the best possible for the people who need the help so it is uh, from a united way perspective a pleasure to be able to work so closely um, with this, this wonderful group of professionals and these organizations like the Community Health Center, like Public Health, who are really on the ground changing people's lives day in and day out. So uh, we are blessed to, to be in that role. And as we, as we finish up, um, above and beyond thanking our panelists for sharing your your personal stories, your experience, your professionalism, um, and your insight into all of this. Um, again, I want to thank people that are at home um, or at work and, and who are really interested and concerned about the well-being of, of their fellow Oxford County citizens and, and why all of these pieces matter. 
I know that if uh, people are at home and they're looking for ways to make a difference, I think Abbas, you may, might have mentioned this earlier, but please feel free to write or call your MP or MPP to, to really share information with friends, neighbors, book club members, um, all kinds of folks that these this really matters and that advocacy and building awareness and building that capacity goes a long way um, to support the work. Um, there's Oral Health Week in April. Everyone can get on the bandwagon and, and really promote that. If you happen to be at home and you're uh, um, an oral health professional looking to get involved, um, reach out, there's opportunities. And today happens to be Giving Tuesday. And so swinging full circle to the giving part, um, this really is a, a program that does cost money and there, but, but the impact and the return on investment is significant. And so if you're at home and wondering what you can do, there is certainly an opportunity to um, offer your support and your financial support. If you care to make a donation, we would make sure that, uh, again, this is a program that's near and dear to our heart. We know it changes lives and opens up new opportunities. So I will um, leave that. And, and my final piece is so often navigating supports and services is difficult. And so I always want to remind people that if you don't know where to go, if you need assistance and are just overwhelmed, please start with 211. 211 is a 24 hour, seven day a week, 365 day a year free service is an information referral service, and they will help ensure that you get the support, the service, uh, the door that you need to, to then get uh, the additional services. So everyone on behalf of United Way Oxford, uh, my panelists, you were just fantastic. And I think you really opened up people's eyes um, to how important this piece is, and maybe how so many of us have just taken for granted um, what is what is available, and yet, unfortunately, it's not something that's available for all. But because of you and your work and your effort, um, it's it's more and more available for all. And so we're we're just glad to be a little teeny part of it. Thank you for for all you do. Um, you are making our community and the folks who live here um, much happier and healthier. Um, so we are incredibly grateful and thank you for joining us this evening. Um, thank you everyone who's participated. And I remind you that this session has been recorded. It will be available on the United Way website uh, within a few days and it will be available um, on Rogers Cable going forward down the road. So thank you all. Um, there are a few resources that were posted and a few websites um, and following for those that are registered, you will get some follow up email with some of those links as well. And uh, I'll remind you as my parting words, um, when in doubt, if you're looking for information, please call 211. On behalf of United Way Oxford, thank you, everyone. And good night. Thank Bye. you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Kelly. Bye. Nice to be here, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye.